Well, Heather, I've got a lovely black-headed python here. This is a, a non-venomous Australian snake. Is this it, Casper? Casper, yeah, and he, he doesn't have a venom or he doesn't sting you. He asphyxiates you, so he wraps around your neck, stops you from breathing, then goes and swallows your whole. And this is Jabba the Hutt, a green tree frog. And this is the actual frog which I found when I was three years of age. So that's where wild action all started, in Coffs Harbour, in the public toilets, sticking to the urinal. So Jabba's quite an old frog. Very old frog, and one of the oldest frogs in captivity that I know of. It's amazing that they live that long. What have you got over here, Nick? This is a Goliath stick insect, and this is the largest stick insect that we have in Australia. Looks a bit like a stripy asparagus. They like to hang around in our eucalypt trees and eat gum leaves all day. A bad life. <laughs> Christopher, do you think you were destined to run this business? I think so. I, I think that, um, you know, I've never known anything really else. Uh, animals, animals, animals. I mean, we've always been surrounded by animals, had pets in our backyards, travelled to Australia with the family, you know, looking all around uh, and seeing wild things. <laughs> Nicole, how did you get involved in this business? I actually fell into the, the whole thing. I met Chris at university and I was more interested in the human side of things so I did microbiology whereas Chris was always into the plants and the animals. Um, I suppose we we had a bit of a relationship there where he used to copy my notes and my exams and mm -hmm. while he'd be while he would be off running around the desert chasing animals. So <laughs> but it's a different thing being a zoologist and running a business. So do you think you're a natural businessman too? I think so. I think there's a lot of synergies there with animals and you know and business, uh, nature and business. I really don't see a difference really because we're, we're animals ourselves and we forget that Heather you know we're a mammal and everything we do is natural and I think running a business is like running a you know a small little ecosystem you know everything has a cause and effect everything has a you know an effect on everything else um, you know controlling staff and yeah. ringing up clients and competing with competitors uh, all this natural selection tooth and claw stuff uh, is what animals do out in their natural environment and that's what we do in business. Well we'll talk about uh, the business in a moment but um how many animals have you got? And where are they? We've forgotten. Apart from these ones here. We've got thousands of animals. We've probably got about a thousand larger animals and, you know, probably about 2,000 invertebrate spiders and scorpions and you know, marine animals like uh, blue ringed octopus. But, um, you know, we, we kept them at a little private zoo in the Macedon Ranges, uh, just north of Melbourne. We've got a 12 acre private zoo. It used to be an old wildlife park and we closed it down and we, we use it as a base where we breed our endangered animals and take them forth out into the public. Do you need special certification to? To run a wildlife zoo like this? Uh, we actually have a, hello, Jabba. <laughs> we have a, a special license with the, the government in Victoria, a demonstration, a demonstration education license. Um, yeah, and look, I'm a micro, oh, Nicole's a microbiologist, I'm a zoologist. Uh, yeah, so we've been working very, very hard at doing this, haven't we? <laughs> it's taken a long time. Well, yes, and uh, you're becoming successful. So um, do you think part of the success is just driven by your own passion about what you do? I think it's just passion, but it's also hard work and, and training ourselves to be, you know, more focused on our business and having strategies. Um, you know, we, we fell by the wayside for a while. We, we, we couldn't control, this, you know, get the staff that we needed and we, you know, the marketing side of it and the advertising side of it. We've learnt all that and we've got better and better at it. We've adapted just like any animal does out there in the environment. So, Well, you offer different um, hands-on wildlife programs. Just explain a little bit about what you do. There's four different programs that we do. Um, th there's an Australian animal program which mainly looks at reptiles, amphibians, mammals and birds. And then when there's a marine rock pool show which looks at life under the sea. Um, most of those, if not all of the animals, we actually find in Port Phillip Bay. So that's great to take and show the kids as well. We do an invertebrate show which is looking at insects and mini beasts, animals without backbones. And our last show is an endangered species program which is great because we're actually have the licences to breed and keep some very rare and endangered animals and we're able to take them into schools and teach children about them. Well, are, are school children your biggest market? Is schools where you really head? At the moment they are, yeah. I mean, we're, we're looking to branch off into corporate and um, into sort of tourism, but at the moment the schools would be the largest majority of our work. Probably be 80% of our work, 20% corporate, uh, but it's uh, rapidly changing, isn't it? And do the children get to touch the animals? That's the whole idea. Our shows are interactive. We take the animals into the classroom, they get to touch, feel, smell them. I mean, it's really sad this day and age that children are so far removed from nature. I mean, we all are. And we've forgotten our hunter-gatherer skills and, 
you know, we're so far removed from the natural world. Well, you're getting the word out now about your business. It's obviously going from strength to strength. But um, how did you start things off? How did you start to market it? Well, uh, when I met Nicole, I was actually studying zoology at Melbourne University and I was living in a share home, 1994, eating two-minute noodles and didn't have a lot of money. Um, had to pay for my um, hex bill, my university fees, and I thought, well, hang on, let's start up a business here. And uh, I, I think we had um, landlords that were yeah. petrified of reptiles <laughs> and animals, and I said, shh, I don't have any pets, and we gradually took over the house and turned it into a menagerie, but they were fine too. They were really accepting and really supportive of what Wild Action did. So, you know, a share home to a zoo. And it's one, one staff member to nine now, so it's just basically we've increased the staff just to meet the demand of work. Well, how, how easy is it to find people who will join you on this journey? Extremely difficult. Um, you have to have someone with a, a science background, so a science degree. They need to be animated, they need to be able to keep a two-year-old child sitting down listening to them for an hour. Um, they, so they need that as well as the animal handling skills and being able to look after some animals at home. So. It's a very <laughs> demanding position. <laughs> well, for both of you, can you describe a, a typical day in the life of, of Wild Action Productions? It's never typical. When you run a zoo, you might have foxes on the property, you might have staff, you know, car breakdowns, you know, six staff or... Uh, Probably animals. a four o'clock, four o'clock alarm. Four o'clock alarm, yeah. <laughs> Wake up, ten cups of coffee and we don't stop till 10.30 at night time. So it's um, putting very, all the animals to bed. Yeah, and just you know managing staff and and cars and fleets of cars and clients and it's just. Um, and we have two of our biggest animals at home as well, a little two-year-old and a four-year-old. So as yeah. well, they're they're in there as well. They the require mix. a lot of time too. <laughs> have they got their pets too? They've got Charlie Ash. She's four. She's got her favourite, a little rainbow lorikeet called Angel, and he sits on her shoulder or clings on to the the bottom of her shoulder as she walks past, walks around the house. And what's Tashi's little friend? She's Tashi's little, the two-year-old. And Tashi's got a little crocodile called Snappy Tom, a little freshwater crocodile. So, <laughs> you know, they've got their own little pets, unique animals, a dingo puppy. Uh, yeah. Kookaburra that laughs on cue. But you can't lock the kids up in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, sounds so much fun running this business, but um, of course you've got to be uh, sound with your financial management and all that sort of stuff. And as you've grown quite fast, has that been an issue for you? Look, fortunately, Nicole's very wise with her money. Uh, I think that's the Indian background, the, the history, the parentage there of mum and dad, you know, being very shrewd with their money. I think that uh, we never overcapitalise. And as I said, the business is like an ecosystem. It's we never overextend. We just we invest into our business what we earn. We don't you know, overcapitalise. So it, it's it's probably more the staff issue, uh, having enough staff to keep up with the demand of the of the work. Because the minute you say no to a show or you can't fit them in when they want the show, they'll just try someone else. And there are a lot of competitors in Victoria. So it, it's I think that's been a bigger problem is having enough staff to keep up with the demand. And building up our brand too, that you know, there's lots of um, smaller companies out there, snake people, hobbyist enthusiasts, and they've been able to jump on the bandwagon of our success and build their businesses. But yet it's not the same product, it's not the same service, but educating the client that we are different has been tricky. Uh, people just think that snake people are snake people, and it's not, we're not snake people, we're, uh, we do the whole game at yeah. So where would you like the business to grow? We have plans on uh, buying a wildlife park interstate, and we'd like to start up a you know a similar type of interactive zoo like Australia Zoo uh, in South Australia. Uh, we've uh, start up our own uh, TV pilot. We've produced that. Uh, where we're hoping to be the next Harry Butler or David Attenborough. Um, you know that's really our passion. It's not about the money. It's just getting our message out there and uh, you know encapsulating kids' minds to get out there and see all the all things wild. Um, I've, I've heard that you consider yourself more of a David Attenborough than you do of a Steve Irwin. Yeah, look, no offence to um, Steve Irwin, what he did, it was a fantastic thing and great marketing for the natural world, but look, we're more into the scientific facts, it's teaching children about ecology, the language of ecology, and teaching children how to read nature. There's always, there's always a reason for nature. There's always a reason why the animal's sitting over there and not there, because they're endothermic, they're sunbaking. Um, there's, a, there's always a reason why a tree kangaroo is up that tree and not that one because it's eating that plant and that plant's poisonous. So, you know, there's more to it. It's, um, you know, it's, I think it's a little bit different. It's not just a show and tell show. It's, um, yeah, it's a religion. 
Well, nature never turns off, does it? So could you ever turn off from the business? Can you get time out? Uh, when, we, when we do have time out, we take our children to Africa and Tanzania and Kenya. We just saw the mass migration. We took our little kids there. And, uh, it's always animal related, though, so it's never really turning no, off. but why would you want it? <laughs>